So let's kick off. So just to introduce myself, my name is Laura Keeley. I um, spent the last number of years working with uh, athletes across a range of sports around Ireland. So um, I've worked with a few hundred at this stage from nursery level right up to Olympic level. So I suppose I want to give you in the next 40, 45 minutes the stuff I know that will make an impact. And what we can talk about numbers and you know scientific recommendations all we want. But I want to focus on food that you're actually going to be able to go and buy tomorrow. That's going to make a difference. Okay, really, really practical, easy um, to implement strategies and, and recommendations. Now, you're going to get all these slides in a PDF. So um, if you want to take notes, take notes. But I will be giving you um, anything, I suppose, anything maybe I say if you want to write it down. So let's look at performance influencers. So I know we're talking about kids here, maybe kids and adolescents. We probably have a little bit of a mixed mix group. But we just need to understand, like, what determines performance? Because I know, like, if we're talking about under eight nurseries, or we're not out there to win medals and trophies and, you know, get them scholarships to college or anything like that. But I suppose you do want, want them paying at their best and you want them fueling and you want them recovering because then they're just a happier child. Um, and we want to look at, you know, what determines performance. Now, if you've got an older teenager, maybe, someone 14, 15, 16, 17, starts getting a little bit competitive then, so we want to look at, you know, you, you tune a little bit more into this. So talent. So some kids will have a bit of sport and talent and some don't, okay? Um, I was never, we'll say, didn't have much raw talent, but I worked really hard. But talent is a big performance influencer, so that's why you see some kids better than others. And then training, okay? So training will have a big influence on how well people play. So how are they training, how well they're training, how much effort they're putting in, and so forth. But the other thing that I've learned from many years of working with uh, athletes is that there's, a, there's a probably an area that doesn't get focused on enough, and that's the lifestyle and nutrition area. And it has a huge impact on performance. So you could have quite a competitive child, might be 12, and they're planning to, you know, maybe work up, they want to start winning competitions, or they're getting competitive foot matches and so forth like that. And they could have a good bit of talent, they could train and train and train, you're dropping them, you're, you're like, you know, taxi mom, taxi dad, that's running and out of training five days a week. But if they don't get this part right, it's gonna make things so much more difficult. And ultimately, we do see, especially leading into adolescent years, we see kids stop uh, playing their sports. And that's often because everything just gets too much. And we know as well that if we can get this to support the training, support, um, the exercise, you know, support um, competition and matches, you know, that ultimately you'll have a better athlete as well. And I'm going to probably use the word athlete a little bit. I'm going to use it loosely, okay? Because if you have a child that's training and competing, now again, I'm not talking about under eights here, I'm talking, you know, kind of more under 14s, 16s, 18s. But if you have a child training and competing, they're a little athlete, all right? They are, that's just the way it is. You can't say they're not because they're intensely training to win a competition at the end of the day. So you do have a little athlete there. And what we see a lot of the time, folks, is that you'll have kids, adolescents training really hard, multiple sports, training multiple times a week. Sometimes they don't get a day off, and we know this. They're also balancing school. If they're a little bit older, they're balancing, you know, junior search, leaving search, things like that. Um, trying to probably maintain a social life as well. And that's all stress. Okay, it's the good kind of stress. Exercise is the good kind of stress. It's the kind of stress we want in our body, but it's stress nonetheless. And what happens with stress is that the body breaks itself down, okay? It becomes inflamed, um, high rates of oxidation, which is all totally normal, totally fine, can be completely balanced. But when we see a tip and it's not balanced, supported with sleep, supported with the right nutrients, um, we do see things like this crop up. So if you have a younger athlete that is getting niggles all the time, is getting sick all the time, there's something there. You ha this is a red flag. We need to look, look at this, okay? You know, again, kids, we won't, we won't say 8, 9, 10. Well, when we get to kind of 14, 15, 16, and you've got a young, a young player and they're doing soccer, Gaelic, um, cricket, tennis, basketball, whatever it is, they, again, they could play multiple ones, and they're getting niggles, they're struggling with sleep, struggling with energy, um, kind of getting head colds all the time, maybe a chest infection, and that's recurring during the year, you have to take a step back and say, well, there's something here not being addressed. Is it energy intake? Uh, is it sleep? Are we missing a nutrient here? Is it low iron? Is it low vitamin D? Because this is what we see. We see little niggles, we see um, mild illnesses, poor performance will arise. And if that builds up and builds up and builds up, you have something called burnout, which is essentially, it's a, it's a little bit of an old school term. If I've, got, like, if I've got a young GA team in front of me, I'll probably 
have to describe it a different way, but you guys might remember, it's burnout. It essentially just means you can't do it. It'll either take them out of the sport by injury or that they become so demotivated they'll just leave. They just don't want to do it anymore. And we never want to get any kind of an athlete to that. We want to make sure we can see the red flags along the way, take stock and say, we have to change something here. When we can get the nutrition right, so when we can meet energy needs, get carb, uh, carbohydrates right, protein, fats, micronutrients, hydration, sleep, um, all around recovery, we see enhanced performance, okay? The child's more energy, the child's more focused, the child's happier, the child sleeps better. It, it's a case of, you, you'll see that, it's not just, I'm not just talking about being better at the sport, I'm just talking about wanting to do more uh, enhanced mental and physical performance comes from it. Preventing illness, so you just get sick less. All right, you've, you're, you're, again, when you're training, that immune system's just pounding. It's, it's just compromised constantly, constantly, constantly. It gets stronger when it gets the nutrients it needs and is able to build back up again. Promoting training adaptions. Now, this is one, again, a little bit more for kind of adolescent um, teens competing. Now, we won't, I don't like, you know, kids don't train. Kids, <laughs> kids don't train to become kind of fitter or better. They do it for fun. So we'll, we'll just kind of address the adolescent side of things here. If you've got a young uh, GA player or again a young soccer player, male or female at this stage, it, it's kind of, I do see it a lot with the teenage boys. They want to put on muscle. All right, this is what I'm seeing. This is kind of, kind of button heads with a few of the, the younger teams I work with because they have this priority to, to, to build muscle, which isn't, you know, if they, they're playing soccer or Gaelic or cricket or anything like that, it, it should be focused on performance. But if you can get your young athlete fueling well around training sessions, recovering, um, they'll actually feel better, they'll actually, the, the training adaption will promote it. So if you think about it, again, say you have a son and he's playing GAA, like he has to understand that within that, that if he's doing endurance runs, he's actually not getting fitter during that run. If he's in the gym lifting weights, he's not getting stronger in the, in the, in the gym session. If he's doing shuttle runs for sprints, he's not actually getting faster. The whole idea of training is that you press a load on the body, you, you're placing a stimulus on it, uh, you break it down, you cause inflammation, um, all that, but in the rest period, it builds back up again. So then in the next session, they're fitter, faster, stronger. The point here is that this is, this is how you convince them to start following what I'm recommending, because that's going to be a little bit of a battle as well, is that if they can get the right foods after training sessions, the right sleep, they'll actually just get better as athletes. All right, this is how you get them to prioritize it, to tune into it. Um, optimizing body composition then, and then the... the I suppose the psychological boost that the, they get by having, you know, known that they're prepared, known that they, they fueled up, known that they're recovering well, and known they're focused on the nutrition. So this is the athlete food pyramid. So like all food pyramids, the absolute priority is the bottom. This is the message that you're going to bring home, especially if you've got your deal with an adolescent, because what we see is that, especially kind of clever social media marketing, things like that, that uh, parents are dealing with adolescents looking for protein powder, creatine, um, and a wide range of supplements that they don't need. So the absolute priority, and as I, like this, you will see like Premier League soccer players work off this, Olympians work off this, uh, world-class athletes work off this, because the absolute highest important for any athlete, and this is again, this will work from under eights up, is regular whole food, okay? So the priority is carbohydrate, or excuse me, calories first of all. The athlete needs to make sure they're getting the right energy intake. Right? There's severe consequences if you have a young athlete that doesn't get the amount of calories they need. And I'll just touch on in a second. After that, it's carbohydrates. After that, it's protein. After that, it's fat, then vitamins and minerals and hydration. We can get all of these needs from regular whole food. All right, in a very, very simple diet, we can probably meet 80% of this. We don't need a huge amount of fancy foods. We don't need very expensive foods to meet this. And after that, okay, so basically for adolescents and children, we cut off here. This is all we need. Yes, when I work with older athletes, we look at things like whey protein, Lucase, Club Energize, you know, that's sports specific nutrition. And then the absolute least of my worries when it comes to any athlete I work with as supplements. They're there, I'll educate my athletes on them. We'll use the ones that work once we get their diet where it needs to be. But if you've got a, anyone under 18, they don't need any supplements. A um, couple of exceptions with health ones, but in terms of uh, athletic performance, no. So if you've got an 18, 16, 17 year old teenage boy at home and he wants whey protein bought or he wants creatine, 
he does not need it, okay? Not until we have the diet where it needs to be first. And even at that, I would probably wait until they're probably 20, 21 before we start looking at any kind of dietary supplements. So that's where we start. So that's where your priorities are when it comes to fueling the athlete, okay? Um, with all of this said, when you are making any changes, or if you do make an, intend to make any changes within the diet of your adolescent or, or your, kind of your child athlete, is that we're taking a balanced approach, okay? We want everybody, this should be a priority, but definitely for your younger child, a healthy relationship with food, okay? So that means if you do one thing from here on out, and, and you know, it's, it's, I'm giving you kind of the, the flash version of everything, but don't refer to food as good or bad. It's not. Food's not bad or good. It's not a villain. It's not a hero, okay? It's just food. In context, every food fits in your diet, and I mean every single food. There is room for it. Food is more nutritious or it's less nutritious. That's how you start thinking of food. What way am I feeding my athlete? What have they had? Have they made 80% of their needs? That's no problem, let's have a takeaway, okay? Have we met the, the, the basic needs of definitely two portions of fruit, three portions of veg a day? Are they getting kind of two to three portions of dairy a day? Are they getting one to two portions of healthy fats a day? Maybe one portion of uh, pulses or legumes a day? Um, two to three portions of lean meats. If, if you're a, a meat eater, of course, you can meet your protein needs with animal-based foods, which we'll talk about. Are they getting lots of hydration? Like, that's your priority. And that's your focus. So from here on, if you're making changes from tomorrow onwards, you're focusing on bringing food in, not cutting it out. So instead of, instead of this conversation with your child of going, you can't have that, you can't have that, instead you're going to go, we're going to try and eat more food. This is why I've, I have a little... We'll park the religious reasons for Lent for a second. I have a big issue with Lent because Lent is very restrictive. And Lent is, we're cutting out this, we're cutting out this, we're cutting out this. And again, if there's religious reasons, absolutely, that's, that's a different, different case. But many people don't do it for religious reasons. They do it for, actually, it's a, good, it's a good excuse to cut this out and it'll make me healthier. It doesn't. Generally, you have a miserable 40 days and then eat 16 Easter eggs. So, <laughs> it, it, but it, it is, and this, is, this, is, this whole thing, is, it's the whole psychological narrative around food, okay? So... If you're making any changes with your child, your adolescent, you start talking about bringing things in. Leave them with their own habits for the moment, because that's not what you, you don't say, you're eating three bags of crisps a day, we're stopping that. Instead, just be like, why don't we try and get a couple more portions of fruit in? And just start shifting that a little bit, very gently. So this is what we do. So again, this, and this goes for everybody. This is, this is a slide I use at pretty much every presentation I do. We're bringing in, this is 80% of your intake, this is 20, this has its place. It's Friday night with the family, it's a trip to the cinema, um, it's a quick one when we're all knackered after coming home from a, from a hike up the sugar loaf, let's see, we'll get a takeaway. That's fine, that's completely fine. But it, and these foods will always live alongside each other. Okay, the issue is when these foods replace these foods, that's an issue because if you have a child that's snacking the whole way through the day on bisc biscuits, um, crisps, chocolate, it means that they don't have any hunger for fruit, they don't have any hunger for dairy, they don't have any hunger for vegetables. And that's the issue. So we're just, they live alongside each other and we're gonna, you have to just shift it so it's more of this, less of this. Just on to energy now. So, so if you've got a child, and again, this comes back to how active they are, you're kind of their, you know, as I'm sure you are already, their monitor. You're watching everything they do. You're probably like a hawk anyway. Um, how do you know if your child's getting enough energy? Because we need energy for a lot of things, just us, okay? Sitting down, if you're to sit down all day, you burn the most amount of uh, calories you need for the whole day, but 75% of your calories is just keeping this all regulated. So respiration, digestion, hormone function, bone health, cognitive function, all takes loads of calories, okay? Calories are a friend, we're not afraid of them. And when it comes to fueling kids, you have to understand that, as well as their biological function, as well as their movement, and some kids are like, like ants, they just never stop moving, okay? It's constant moving. Um, growth, okay? If kids don't get enough energy in their growth phases, okay, it means, you know, uh, less bone health later in life, or reduced bone health later in life, uh, reduced muscle function, joints, and that's just kind of the real heavy physical side of things. So after all this, before we even get to their actual training sessions, because we're talking about young athletes, they need, they need um, energy for all of these things. So I don't go into a huge amount about energy availability and low energy availability and relative energy efficiency in sport, because, which is um, 
it's basically an athlete when they don't get enough energy and the, the detriments they may see. We will talk about the menstrual cycle towards the end when it comes to young, um, young female teenage athletes. But you need to kind of be like a hawk when it comes to your child. If they're lethargic, if they're getting sick, if they're getting injured, if they're pale, um, you know, their hair, their skin, anything like that. If you notice over a period of weeks, obviously that's a big red flag that there, there may be something going on. But especially if you've got an active child, like if you have a child that's playing three different sports, that's maybe training twice a day some days. Like if they're showing any signs of low energy, um, which is again, mood, crankiness, trouble sleeping, be feeling cold, um, trouble recovering between sessions. Like kids should be like ping pong balls coming back from training sessions. Not a bother, ready to go, you know, next day ready to go for another training session again. Two training sessions again, no, or a day, no problem at all. You have to be aware of if they're dragging their heels, if they, they're sleeping in the morning, if they're just not themselves, are they eating enough food? The absolute foundation of an athletic diet, okay, so we're talking about mainly about I'm not kind of talking about strategy sports like darts, I suppose. We're talking about active, active sports, okay? The, the foundation we're looking at is carbohydrates. So if, again, if you have a young athlete playing team sports or running, tennis, anything like that, carbohydrates are what you need to focus on to fuel that child, okay? Yes, we'll talk about fat. Yes, we'll talk about protein. need both of those. But carbohydrates make up the foundation, okay? So... If you want to portion out stuff for your child, it's kind of work. I'm going by their fist, okay? So we kind of, this is a rough way to do it for the size of somebody. So again, we're talking about the child here, but these are the foods that need to kind of be the foundation of their diet. So if they're having, ideally they're having a high fiber breakfast in the morning if you can. I know there are you know, plenty of fussy eaters out there. So ideally it's something like shredded wheat, bran flakes, wheat bix porridge oats, whatever it is, that's kind of how, how you're starting the day, or maybe whole grain toast or something. Um, and we're going to talk about building a balanced meal in a second, but spuds, pasta, rice, couscous, quinoa, bagels, wraps, anything like that is essential in the, in the child's diet if it's playing a lot of sport, okay, if they're playing a lot of sport, because this is what's going to give, give, give the child energy. So this should make up, you know, decent portions, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. After that, you can bring in some snacks. Now, big thing to know about, and this is, I always bring this up, nutrition for performance, nutrition for health overlap, but they're not the same thing, okay? So there is some stuff that absolutely, eat it for, it, it's gonna give you quick energy. If you've got a child going out to a match um, and they've literally just ran home, grabbed something real quick, they're running out there, a little cereal bar in the car, it's perfect, okay? If you, if you don't want a banana, obviously you go fruit first if you can. Um, nutritious things, fruit smoothies, uh, you know, assorted fruit, whatever it is. But if the child won't eat that, like a bowl of cornflakes a couple hours before a match is perfect. Um, you can go healthier, beans on toast, you know, popcorn is very, a very, very healthy source of carbs as well. Granola and yogurt, you know, it's there, thereabouts. Nature Valley bars, like not, Nature Valley bars don't have much in the offer of like vitamins or minerals or protein or fiber. But you know what? If you've got a, a, a child running out the door and they're to come from one match and they're going to another training session, absolutely no harm, okay? It'll give them energy to get through that session. It doesn't make up the whole of their diet. It's that freedom to know that it doesn't always have to be the most nutritious choice if it's gonna fuel your young athlete. After that then, we're looking at protein, okay? So again, rough, rough guts guide on, on protein, like much like carbs, just go by your hand. It's just making sure that you know there's a protein source with the child's main meals. It's going to help. They, they will need more protein than an average child if they're doing a lot of sport. They'll have more muscle damage. That needs to be built back up again. So they need a constant kind of, it's good to dose of protein regularly throughout the day. If you're plant-based, use things like beans, peas, lentils, tofu, um, edamame beans, all like, that's pretty healthy for us all, by the way, so no harm. But if that's if you want to go more plant-based, you can get plenty of plant protein. You just have to be a little bit more tuned into it. So again, if you're going by kind of the palm of your hand, it's about 20 grams, roughly. If you put two palms together, it's about 40. So for your child, like roughly probably just a palm full will be fine per meal. Like they don't need two or three chicken breasts. Now, if you've got a 16 year old and he's six foot tall and you know, 90 kilos, he needs a little bit more. But, you know, the average child, average, like, young adolescent will be fine with, a, with two or three palmfuls of, of protein per day because we'll bring in snacks as well. Snacks look anything like this. 
So again, obviously we'll, we'll add a carb source with these. It'll be cheese on crackers or tuna or beans on toast, eggs on toast, things like that. I'll talk about milk in a second. But again, it's just making sure that two to three times a day they're getting these protein snacks or you're sending them to school with something you know, that's very easy, very transportable in the bag that's not going to kind of make a mess and that they're likely to have. So again, these protein pouches from Aldi and Idle are just great because they don't need a spoon. Put them in the gear bag. You know, they're quite sweet, so the kids will eat them. Um, have a mix, so just be aware. They're not all yogurt. Some of them are soft cheese. So we do want yogurt in the child's diet as well for the good gut health, because it'll have live bacteria. So I would make sure you, these, grain, these grain ones are a good example of the yogurt and the broccoli ones are soft cheese. So just have a little look at the back and make sure you're getting a mix. And then something in the evening like chocolate protein pudding, like it's fine, just keeping that protein in throughout the day. Fat then. Um, Thankfully, the low-fat diets are a thing of the past. I'm sad, I, I definitely remember them when I was younger. Uh, we need fat in our diet, but not all fat is created equal. So we have our healthy fats and our less healthy fats. So the healthy fats we want to focus on, that we want more of in the diet, are kind of some examples here. These are unsaturated fats, polyunsaturated fats. And of course, the, the example that I'm going to give you today includes two very, very healthy sources of fat, all right, chia seeds and, whole, and um, peanut butter. So we're going to use those. This is how, when we talk about kind of encouraging kids to have more healthy fats, you can kind of struggle sometimes because this mightn't be an option. This probably definitely won't be an option. Probably not an option. Maybe peanuts. Maybe if you can get mixed seeds, if you get your child eating like a handful of cashew nuts or almonds, brilliant. I know that will be a struggle some of the time. This is a nice little lad here, mill seeds. If they won't even go as far as here, like if you try and make these energy balls for them and they won't even have them, milled seeds. So the milled chia seeds, you can sneak it into a curry, you can sneak it into a bolognese, you can sneak it into a dinner, you know, a shepherd's pie. You can sneak it into Tweetabix, things like that, because they don't notice it, they don't notice the, the, the texture of it. So that might be an option as well. Peanut butter is an, an easy way to start, I think. If you're getting a peanut butter, get one with 100% nuts, avoid ones with palm oil and sugar. Um, a little bit of salt's fine. So let's just run through everything. So that's your carbs, fats, and proteins. Um, how to build a balanced meal. So when I'm working with adolescents, and I work with a lot of them, uh, we'll start here. Because I feel like one meal that, from a young age, children and adolescents should be taking responsibility for is their breakfast. Grand with their lunch, grand with their dinner. Um, they might, you know, that might take a while. But breakfast is a very simple one to say, that's you now, you have to go, go do that for yourself. And how you start building, okay, we're going to start with, with carbs. So we want some complex carbohydrates. So with a Weetabix, porridge, if you're having a bit of toast, whatever it is. And you add protein. It might look like eggs. I'm talking about, um, I have milk and yogurt here. I mean dairy milk and, and dairy yogurt here. Um, if you're using a milk alternative, it won't have the same nutrients. It doesn't have the same protein content. It doesn't have the same micronutrients. So I am speaking exclusively from, of, from a cow's milk perspective here. So... We'll kind of mostly stop here. I'd like you to push on with this. We want to bring a healthy fat. The way you have to look at it is that every meal is an opportunity to get, uh, to hit nutrient targets. And that's for everybody, but every meal is a chance for your child to hit their nutrient targets. Now, it doesn't have to be 100% all the time. I've said this, it doesn't, like, it's, it's absolutely grand if you get 80% of the way there. But just, it's getting that mindset of what else can I just add here to make this just more nutritious. So we'll add healthy fat if we can. Again, those nuts and seeds option. If you can get your child eating nuts and seeds, it's, it's, it's a real winner. And then fruit and veg. So as I said, you're kind of aiming for a minimum of two portions of fruit and three portions of veg. Now, the fruit's the easy part in this. I know that. And I will talk about how to get more veg in. We're going to go through two slides on that. So hopefully you'll be able to take something from it. But getting a veg in, a fruit and veg in at the start of the day is just so much easier. Just it gets you a little bit there. And this whole idea about breakfast, we'll go through four more examples here. So this whole idea about breakfast, lots of people don't eat breakfast, okay? And this whole thing of you have to have breakfast, you don't have to have breakfast. You can absolutely be 100% healthy without breakfast. But the studies show that those who have a balanced breakfast are far more likely to make better food choices throughout the day. Um, you know, they have stable energy, they're more alert um, than if you leave a long gap before eating. So just like, again, it's not, you're kind of trying to, especially if you've got a teenager, I know that can be a little bit more difficult about getting them out of bed and getting them up in time to do something like this. So it's just, this is obviously the 100% of the way. Again, if you can get 50 to 80% there, most days you're doing okay. But it's just to show you where you can get a little bit more kind of nutrients in in this meal. 
and then taking that and flipping it onto lunch as well. So again, taking your bread, wraps, bagels, whatever it is, you know, wraps here. Um, I give a vegetarian option as well when I'm doing this, but you can see here, like the idea is that you're trying to just get more veg in with these meals. So like one to two portions of veg, getting healthy fats in there. Where can you move it into kind of thing? And then the same with dinner. So like taking that carbs, protein, healthy fat and, and your vegetables. So again, it looks a bit dry. Obviously we're adding sauces and cheese and stuff in here as well. It's not completely all dull, but it's just to show you what should, what are you looking for on the plate to see where the nutrients are? Where am I getting my nutrients on this plate? Salmon's amazing because it ticks off to, look, the, the, just two seconds on salmon. It, we, should, we should all really be eating salmon twice a week. I completely understand that always doesn't, doesn't happen. If you're having salmon, try and get it in at least once a week. A good rule would be, you know, years ago we used to have fish on a Friday. If you can even like have it so, look, here's the meals we're having Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and just even plan as far as Monday to Thursday. But salmon always comes in there like on a Tuesday night or a Wednesday night, like just having that set rule in your house. So when anybody comes home from school, they're not surprised at salmon for dinner because it's been said there for the last two weeks, we're having salmon every Tuesday now and that's it. Um, it can kind of make it a little bit easier because salmon's one of those healthy foods you can have. It gives us omega-3s and we can't make omega-3s in our body. So, you know, for not having salmon or oily fish, we should really be supplementing with an omega-3. Um, but that's essentially how we're going to build out these balanced dinners. Like, what do they look like? What can we bring in? What are we missing? Like, if you can look at that and think of your dinners in the house for the last two or three nights, maybe don't count the weekend, maybe go back to last Thursday if you can. And just think about what you've been having and potentially what, what are you missing? Um, and just on that note as well, stir, uh, frozen veg is fine, guys. All right. You know, if it's a case where you have, you're running in, you want to make a dinner in 15 minutes. If you've got chopped mixed peppers frozen there, chopped onions there, chopped stir fry mix, whatever it is, use it. Like, it's absolutely fine. About roughly about a handful, a large handful would be a portion. So you can do it by that. But there's no issue. If you, if you haven't got the time to make veg or peel and chop veg from scratch it's absolutely fine to use a uh, stir fry veg and then if you're even at a stretch and you need to use tin veg go ahead and use it it's better than no veg at all okay we don't always have to be perfect with this with these things so let's look at how to increase veg in a child's diet so this is the this is the hard one okay and, and I'm, I'm fully fully appreciative of that because you know it's it's you can deal with a lot of picky eaters easy thing you can start to do is blend them in if you have a child that doesn't mind having pasta sauce or kind of pizza sauce, because you can even make your own pizza with this. Uh, you can get a pizza base. And all, even if you wanted to take a jarred sauce, honestly, if you want to take a jarred sauce, put it in, an, if you have a Nutribullet or a blender, and stick it in with, if you can like saute off, um, cook off some like peppers and tomatoes and onion or whatever, and pop them in a blender with a little bit of pasta sauce, you'll get in a lot more, or a lot more veg into them. They won't know it's there. Cook lentils as well. They won't know it's in it, okay? Um, after that, you can get things like hummus, uh, bean dips, guacamole, um, and breadsticks, carrot sticks, um, slices of toast, anything like that. Um, try and get some more. Using pureed fruit, okay, so again, it's, it's uh, kind of touching on fruit and veg here. So we'll talk about smoothies in a second. But you can add pureed fruit to things uh, like oats, uh, like applesauce and things like that and will help get their, get their fruit and veg intake up. And then smoothies are obviously an easy one. So I'm going to give some smoothie examples to you all. You get a PDF, but you can get things like avocado and spinach into smoothies without you know, too much fuss if you get the right smoothie recipe. So it's, it's, a, it's just another option if you're really struggling. Uh, and then kind of disguising. We're back to kind of just hiding veg in meals. So there's a couple of things you can do, like adding mashed cauliflower uh, to spuds and then grating carrots into mince. So there's, there's one kind of one, if you can get, if you're really struggling, like a shepherd's pie is a good option to get a lot of this stuff in if you can sneak it in. So again, because of your, your, your potato topping, if you had mashed cauliflower in there, red peppers and tomatoes into your sauce, if you're kind of making a little bit of a tomato sauce with that shepherd's pie, and then grated carrot, cook, uh, grated carrot cooked into mince. My brother has twins that, um, that are eight and they won't eat any veg, but this is one he swears by. That is his one way. And even if they, they say you can p they can pick around the peas and the carrots and they think they've taken out the veg, so that kind of, then they'll stop. They don't realize it's actually hidden throughout the rest of the layers. So it's just if you're really struggling, like if you've got a child that's eating literally you know, the, the very, very restricted, narrow diet. This is just one way to try and, and, and get, get, um, 
more vegetables into them. So just onto hydration now. So um, one thing to, I suppose, if you've got a child that's quite active that, you know, are, are training most days or whatever, hydration's a huge thing. Dehydration would be the first thing that slows you down. And that go, obviously goes for everybody, but it's the first thing that will slow a child down as well. So keeping a bottle of water beside the bed or a glass of water, obviously if you don't want to go plastic, you can just keep a glass of water. So get them into the habit of just when they get up a few sips, start sipping straight away. Um, maybe keep a, could be a bottle of water in the bathroom as well. So after they brush their teeth, they take another few mouthfuls. Um, three litres, we go three bottles of water a day, it's about 1.5 litres, but we'll talk more specifics in a second. Obviously if they have more fruit and veg, they will have a higher intake of water. There's, if you have a child that really struggles to drink water, like really struggles, there's no harm in throwing a little bit of sugar-free cordial into it. Like honestly, if it means that you've got, a, especially an active child, that they're actually getting enough fluids in, it's fine. Um, and then around training sessions, making sure they have a bottle of water at training sessions and they are drinking after it. So if, again, if you've got a young athlete coming home at eight, nine o'clock, which happens plenty, they have to be a little bit like, there's your glass of whatever, your juice, your milk, your water, whatever it is, and making sure they're drinking it while they're having a, their recovery meal, which I'll, I'll talk about now. But it's just, they need that prompt. I know because I chase adults around doing this. They actually, like, I have to force this on adults. So I know kids are, are much more likely to forget about their hydration. You're gonna get these slides. So I want you, like, as much as I want you to show everything, I definitely want you to show this to whoever you have at home. This is how they determine if they need to drink water, and it's the best habit they're gonna get in at a young age. Okay, this, and this goes for everybody, all right? This is how you tell if you're hydrated, if your urine's a pale yellow color. It doesn't need to be completely clear, you don't need to be going to the toilet every half an hour, but we want to be around here. <clears throat> the darker it gets, the more dehydrated you are. You've got, if you go to the toilet less, <clears throat> or you've less volume of, of urine as well, that shows a little bit of dehydration. So you wanna get your child, just tell them to check, especially on training days. Just, just tell them to check, have a little look, um, open that conversation up with them, and then they'll, they'll take that habit in. They'll take it for life, and they'll be, so, uh, they'll be much more um, tuned in to, to hydrating and drinking than after that. Obviously, you know, this is a disaster. This, <clears throat> this, in terms of performance, both mentally and physically, a child will struggle if they're dehydrated to this extent. So it's just a good habit for life. Um, They'll use it as a prompt, like I said, to actually get more fluids in. Um, just let's talk about pre-exercise eating. So what are you focused on when you have a child that has training at six o'clock? Um, and you could, again, you could have a child that's training every day and I appreciate that, or training twice a day. But remember, we're going high in carbohydrates and low in fats. I say this, so we're talking like in the four hours before a session, um, try to avoid giving your child kind of very, very high fat foods. So, um, I'm probably talking more about processed meats here, so kind of rashers, sausages, and, and, and eggs separately. Um, eggs aren't, aren't processed or anything. But it's just we want to lower fats, okay? If you have a child that complains, or an adolescent complains, of, as soon as they start warming up, that their stomach is turning, they're cramping, um, they're getting a little bit of, of stomach upset or, or nausea or anything like that, it can come right back to what did they have in the hours before, what were they eating? So you just need to make sure, watch that fat intake, um, like if, if they're going out playing a match, like no big mass of creamy carbonaras an hour before or anything like that, because that food will just sit there. Fat will slow down your digestion and it will just sit here um, and they'll find some discomfort and they just won't be able to play as well. And again, it goes back to that, like you don't want a child coming home after a match saying I was terrible, I didn't feel well, I couldn't run, I had a pain in my side. And then they're not, they're not happy, you know, we want to keep them happy. And if it can come back to things like this, what are they eating beforehand? Moderate protein's fine. Not, we're not focused on protein for performance. Uh, we want to focus on carbs, lots of fluids, and making sure they're getting that extra amount. If they've matches, they get extra food. They're going to be doing more work, especially if they're playing the full match. If they've got two training sessions in a day, they get more food, they get more carbohydrates, uh, because they're going to have a higher energy demand. If they've got a day where like, it's kind of not, not a huge session, or like they don't have a huge amount going on that day, they don't need as many carbohydrates, much like ourselves. We've got, if we've got, you know, we're not, we're not getting big plates of pasta if we're, if we're not um, doing much movement. We don't need it. We'll look, at, we'll look to get more protein, more healthy fats, more, more veg in. So we're just going to look at the five Fs of fueling for, for um, this is how you're going to remember. So food, high carb food. All right, this is going to be our fueling. So the morning of a match, 12 o'clock, we want to make sure that like, we don't really need like 
they're not going to have eggs and bacon that morning because that's not going to really fuel them. We're going to look at what carbs can we get into them. Fruit's a really easy one. All right, so fruit, this is why if you can get your child eating kind of two to three portions of fruit a day, it's just so good for fueling. All right, fueling and refueling. Um, and it's super nutritious, really good for us. So this is what we'll look to. Uh, frequencies, so this is where this comes in. It's called, the, I, I, I shorten it to the 631 rule, but it's between four and six hours out, your last, this is where you're gonna get a large meal into the child or adolescent, okay? Two to, two to three hours then we're gonna have small snack, okay? Yeah, um, gonna be very carby, and then about an hour out if you can get something else into, into them again, just to fuel up. So if we're using that 12 o'clock and you're up about seven, this is perfect for this meal, all right? That's gonna be like if you can get a big bowl of porridge into them with a banana and a glass of juice and some healthy seeds in there, yeah, if you can. Uh, or if you can get a couple of slices of toast and an egg into them, perfect, glass of juice, perfect. It just, it's going to be bigger. The reason why it's bigger at that time is because we need to allow time to digest and absorb the nutrients. There's no point in having a dinner or a massive breakfast at 11 o'clock and send the child out to pitch at 12 o'clock. The food's gonna sit there. The food is not where it needs to be. Our carbohydrates need to digest, they need to be absorbed, they need to move through our bloodstream, into our muscles, into our liver, and it's then used as energy. It's not used as energy if it's still sitting in our stomach an hour when we're running onto the pitch. Then we'll have a large snack, uh, two to three hours. So again, about 10 o'clock, potentially um, a little bowl of cereal at that time, or a toast and jam, a little pack of pancakes. Again, it doesn't have to be the most nutri nutritious things because we are just trying to fuel the, uh, the athlete going out. Um, we're gonna go through some examples of those. And then 30 to 60 minutes, you know, if it's a little packet of Haribo, or if it's a, preferably, of course, a banana, or a little, um, glass of juice or something like that. But again, it, it's when it comes to crux time, I'd be more, obviously carb gels we wouldn't include there for a child, but I'd be more concerned about making sure that the child is fueled going out rather than too concerned about them having a packet of Haribo. So we do want, the, we do want to focus on nu nutritious foods, do not get me wrong, but we also don't want to kind of miss the wood for the trees either. Okay, so we are focusing on making sure the child's fueled. Fluid then, so uh, more specifically, if you're looking for kind of a fluid target, being about a bottle, if you have a, like that, a match, uh, trying to get about maybe a pint of water into them over two hours would be perfect, just to make sure they're flu they're, they're, um, they are hydrated. And then just stuff you don't want them to have, okay? Don't have high fiber uh, foods in the four hours before, high fat foods, f excuse me, fried foods or spicy foods. I know it's unlikely you get child beating spicy food, but like if you have an adolescent, like no curries or in very spicy foods within the, the, the training session or match, because what happens is it just causes GI discomfort uh, and then you're gonna have issues. So this is the kind of things we avoid. Uh, just looking at that, what that fueling meal, so about three hours out, that specific fueling meal would look like something like this. And the reason why we hone in on this one is because this is the one I find people get wrong the most often, okay? So we're two to three hours out from the session, Again, you don't have to, this doesn't have to be, if you've got child training every single day, you don't have to stress a huge amount, but it's just getting into the habits of what, what, what's more appropriate to eat in the two hours before a session. And it does look like less healthy food sometimes. Absolutely, fueling smoothies, super healthy. <clears throat> you know, banana on toast with honey, perfectly fine. But if you do go down the route of, especially if it's match time and you've got a nervous child or a nervous, a nervous kind of teenager and they're struggling with food, like things like a little pack of pancakes, crumpets and jam, toast and jam, bacon and jam, anything like that would be perfectly fine. Granola, milk, um, that would all be perfect down here. What you're looking for is something that's low in fat, moderate protein's fine, it's low in fiber. Um, it's gonna be digested easy because it has very fast acting carbohydrates. It's not gonna fill them up too much either. And then just looking at recovery. So that's, that's before. So just stuff to, to, we'll talk about refueling and repairing in a second. But again, we come back to this hydration. That is the first kind of priority that often athletes miss out that I work with. They just go straight on to protein shakes and things like that. But the priority is to rehydrate. So if you have anything, if you're picking your child up, the first thing is that you've got something that they can drink. Just, here you go. And I'll, we'll talk about really good options here in a second. Replenishing, so getting, trying to get some vegetables or some fruit or something into them afterwards and then getting them to bed. Like they will not recover unless they sleep. That's just a flat line, we'll talk about sleep in a second. But this is what, this is what we're kind of trying to cover. Um, easy ways we're gonna do that, okay? This is, it, it, it's not complicated food, all right? You're making sure, again, heavy sessions, if they're coming in, if they don't want their dinner, what can we get into them? Well, like even if it's like they're coming in the afternoon, like things like milk and fruit, sandwiches and fruit, um, 
If you're on the go and they have to run into the shop to grab something, like a Muji and a banana is perfect. And I'll, and I'll talk about some, I'll talk about milk in a second now. But even if you can get like beans and toast, eggs and toast, and it's all perfect. Like the, this is stuff I use with like very highly competitive athletes. It's all the simple stuff that works, um, especially for recovery. And like, even like I said, like uh, if you can get nothing into them, but a you know, bowl of cornflakes and a little protein pouch, like that's good enough for what you're trying to do. Like your goal is to get them recovered. And this is where I come on to milk. So milk, when you, you, you try and make things easy on yourself, okay? Milk will cover off four of your five ores, okay? It'll rehydrate you, refuel, repair, and replenish, okay? It is one of the best recovery foods you can have um, yourself and your child to have because it does all of this. So again, if you're picking up your, your teenager, you're picking up your child from a training session and you have 500 mils of milk in a carton, hand it to them, and a banana they're gonna get a huge amount of recovery straight away. Um, the rehydration, it rehydrates quicker than water and a sports drink, refuels with the carbs it has, repairs with the protein it has, and it's the, the protein that's in milk, okay, so if you, again, this, you can bring this home, if you've got a child at home or an adolescent, will probably say, that's looking for you to buy protein for them, a tub of protein, a bag of protein. You can tell them that what they're buying is just really expensive dried milk, because that's all it is, it's whey protein. You can get that in a pint of milk, and with a pint of milk, you'll also get vitamins and minerals, you'll also get uh, carbohydrates that you need and you'll also re uh, rehydrate yourself. So again, if you can get um, the fortified, the super milk, you can get that in Aldi and, and Lidl as well as a home brand. That'll just give you a little bit more, but even just regular milk is fine as well. Yes? Uh, what about protein milk? So protein milk is, is just a bit of a gimmick. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, yeah, it has, so 500 mils of regular milk has about 18 grams of protein. The protein milk uh, equal amount is about 27. For the price difference, it's not worth it. Um, you're splitting hairs with 10 grams of protein. I think you could have just another 200 mils of milk later on in the day and you'll hit the same amount. I just, one of those, I'd rather, Muju, to be honest with you, Muju is about 10 cent, 20 cent cheaper, has twice as many carbs, so for recovery, it's actually better. And it's a little bit of sugar added to it, but we're not gonna, be, we're not gonna worry about that. Yeah. I'd, I'd lo I would love to tell you there is, there isn't. There really isn't. It's a very unique food, obviously, but um, there, there isn't. What, the only thing, and he, is it just milk that they won't have? No cheese, So it's all dairy. Yeah. yeah. So the, the alternative is a supplement with a protein, like a, a pea or um, a hemp. I don't mean like a, probably a hemp. Your pea protein is probably your best bet if you want to supplement with a high protein thing. Now you can, like any animal-based products, because then you just go down the meat route, but... There's nothing comparative to milk, unfortunately. I'd love to tell you there was. I'd love to invent one, I'd be a millionaire. <laughs> soy milk is your only, you're, you're only bet. The soy milk, it comes up just slightly under it. Um, off the top of my head, it's for 500 mils, like I, th I think it's about 12 grams, 10 to 12 grams, that's off the top of my head. It's your best bet. Doesn't taste great, it's the only thing as well. But you get chocolate, if you get chocolate soy milk, that's, that's my only, the only one I could give you to compare, unfortunately. I'd love to tell you there's another one. Yeah. Lactose free. You can get lactose free milk, it has everything else, it just has the carbs taken out. So if you're having that for recovery, a banana alongside it or some other fruit alongside it, so that you'll get the carbs in. But that, yeah, you, I'm a big pusher on this lactose free milk now because I used, to, I used to have a lot of athletes that didn't want it because of lactose, and now it's like we can get lactose free. So we're still getting all the, the, other, the other goodness that we could get. Um, just if you got a child uh, early morning training session, this is what we're looking at now. This is for the, uh, the large carb area is only for if you have, um, it's a little bit more competitive or a little bit more intense. If you've a child going out to nursery or, you know, just a Sunday morning run around, don't be worrying about that too much. Um, now, if they are complaining that during the session they're feeling weak or faint or they're struggling during that early morning session, maybe they got a session 10 o'clock and they're just a bit miserable and it's putting them off going, trying to, getting them to have like a bowl of cereal or porridge or rice pudding, it's a big one in my house, um, or toast and beans late just before, like a supper before they go to bed, they'll actually carry those carbs over. So instead of having like a dinner at six and then they might have a few snacks that aren't particularly nutritious and then they're going to bed at 10 and they're up at eight o'clock the next morning, seven o'clock the next morning, I would try and get a large carb meal. Now if they're getting up very early, they'll have time to fuel, but it's just if they don't have time. After that, you're getting them up. It's water or you know, cordial if you can get something into them. Piece of fruit or even a glass of milk, sorry, would work well. Piece of fruit like a banana or half an apple and then a small bowl of cereal. So again, 
if the child eats porridge, and that's brilliant if they do, having a big massive bowl of porridge and then having to go straight on the pitch half an hour later, it's not going to be great. So a little bowl of like Rice Krispies or Corn Flakes or something, just a small amount because um, they'll actually be able to digest it then uh, before they go out. And then recovery then is just that, you know, a, a kind of tuned into making sure that they're eating, especially if you've got an adolescent that goes out with their friends for four or five hours, that might be kind of picking or not, not eating, trying to get them to prioritise having that big meal within one hour, like a decent breakfast or decent lunch, that'll help them, that'll help them recover. Uh, last couple of slides here now, guys. So just sleep. Um, this is what I put up. This is how you're going to, this is how you're going to speak to your child when you go home with your adolescent. Sleeping helps you win matches. Sleeping helps you win games. Sleeping makes you a better athlete. Sleeping makes you perform better. All right? So this is what you get. It actually makes you kick better. Physically, this is what, there's hundreds of studies done around this, performance and sleep. Um, and what can you bring home? But this is the big one. This is for you to kind of, uh, I suppose, earmark or, uh, or make it, remember, less than eight hours consistently will double the risk of injury and less, less than seven will triple the risk of illness. So this is, if you've got maybe a more competitive teenager and they're just not prioritizing sleep and you know they're on their phones watching TikTok at half 12 and because you can hear it or whatever it is, you have to just kind of get them tuned into this, that they're more likely to get injured if they, um, if they don't get an eight hours sleep. Like really up until 18, they need nine to 10 hours sleep a night. Like younger than that, like eight, nine year olds need 10, 11 hours sleep, uh, a lot of them won't get that. And definitely teenagers, teenagers actually need like a, a minimum of nine just for their, like their, their, you know, for their cognitive development. It's still happening at that age. So they need a lot of sleep and a lot of them aren't getting it. And if you've got a teenager out for early morning training sessions on a Saturday and Sunday or up for matches and they're staying up till, you know, one or two o'clock in the morning, they're just not getting that. So it's just one of these things that you're, you're going to go home with that message that they have to prioritise it. Um, just quickly for immune system, guys. Uh, I include this slide because I just want to go through it. So it's just uh, how to make sure your child doesn't get sick. And again, this is real, like you've probably half noticed already, like eat the rainbow. It's very cliche, but it's true. Managing stress. So this is this. I'm not talking about the, you know, the stress or work deadline for a child or anything, but just stress. Exercise is stress. School is stress. There's always a little stressors there and it has to be managed. Um, exercise, they're going to cover that, keeping a healthy weight, being mindful, are they underweight, okay? We have this thing of if a child carries a little bit of weight, we'll, we'll you know, we're, we're quick, quick, quick to flag it. But if a child's a little bit underweight, we're less so. And that can be, um, it can be a concern. Getting enough sleep, obviously. Um, a supplement when needed. So just, we always, we're food first, but we're not food only. Again, just on that, when, if you're not kind of getting minimum of one to two, portions of oily fish a week, I would recommend an omega-3 supplement. Um, and then this time of the year, usually up until Paddy's Day, we recommend a vitamin D supplement from, from Halloween to Paddy's Day. So uh, because we're showing in Ireland that we, we, a lot of us carry low, low vitamin D and vitamin D is a very important part in bone health, but obviously and also in um, cognitive function and in athletic health. So we just need to be mindful of those. Um, just quickly, anybody that has a teenage girl playing sport, we want to keep her in it because we see and have always seen massive drop-offs of adolescent female athletes. It's usually when we lose them. Uh, we have huge numbers all the way up and then there's just an absolute nosedive around kind of 14 to 18, we say. And studies are shown that it's coming back to the menstrual cycle because girls aren't educated in it, girls aren't uh, supported in it. In GAA, we're only now, and sorry, same with the Irish women's rugby, we're only now switching to non-white shorts, which is, I don't know how it's taken this long, because we were losing girls who didn't want to wear white shorts, which is completely fair. So just uh, one thing, we're not going to go through the whole um, mental cycle tonight. I'd love to have time to, but I don't. But one thing you can do is get your daughter to download this app, Fitter Woman, okay? This is an amazing app. It was developed in the Chelsea women's soccer team. Um, and basically it gives you everything. She can put everything into it, activity, symptoms. Um, it can tell her how to prepare. It can tell her what to expect. And just, you know, preparation is half the key in these things. So it's, it's just going to give her, um, there's loads of articles and it's really, really, really good resource. I use it with all my athletes. Um, and, I, and it's just, it takes that, um, it just, like we, like, like, we all have, like the girls have to train, they'll have to play matches no matter what time it is. So it just allows them to better pair, it'll give them some nutrition advice, some recovery advice. It's really, really good. So I definitely recommend that. Um, 
So I'm going to get on, I'm going to make these, it's going to take five minutes we're going to do this in. But while we do that, I'd love if, if you have any questions, pop your hands up.